Hi guy, welcome to the Amiga Armor Podcast. As always, I'm your host Lafarius, and in this week's show we will be taking a look at James Pond, the Underwater Agent. It's been absolutely ages since we last covered a James Pond game, so I'm sort of looking forward to jumping back into the series. RoboCod is one of them outstanding games that everyone seems to love on the Amiga, so stay tuned for that in just a little while. For now, we do need to move over to this week's Amiga news. We always seem to have so much to cover and it's surprising just how many people come forward and actually thank me for putting news articles on the show. I've had a fair few bits on Facebook and the Discord chat room. Yeah, that's sort of a little sneaky plug in there. Go and check them out. Follow the show notes for more details. After all these episodes, you've probably realised by now that I don't usually bother with early game announcements. If they aren't about to come out, or at least on the verge of release, I don't see the point of getting people, well, getting the hopes up and getting everyone excited. But once in a while, some news does catch my eye that is just so astoundingly good that I just can't wait to tell you a lot all about it. It was a long time ago since, well, I covered Indie Heat in an episode. I think it was having about 14 or 15, but I still maintain that it was one of my all-time favourite and most addictive Amiga games. Go back and listen to that if you can put up with the early sort of show type that I was doing. I think it's a lot more developed these days, but, well, I've done the content. Go and have a listen. The reason I'm so excited and worked up is I've just seen over on Indie Retro News about a fan-made follow-up to Indie Hate which practically had me doing cartwheels down the aisles. It's called Formula Fun and it did have a demo out in February. Again, this is pretty old, I'm always a bit behind in the news. The guy behind it is Spider Horace and he seems to have written the whole thing in Amos. It's one of those that mixes in a little bit of super off-road as well, but it's very clear from seeing the footage that Indie Heat is the strongest influence. I was so excited to see this one. It'll be a day one download for me if it ever gets finished and comes out. So fingers crossed Spider Horace manages to come through. If you want to see something that I still play to this day, I'm absolutely addicted to it, then go and follow the show notes and have a read about it. It's been a couple of weeks now since I recorded the last show when this was uh, relevant. But I mean, I do tend to record two shows a week because I always push one out for the Patreon supporters. Again, go and sign up if you want the benefit of that. But when we did the Altered Beast episode, I was really struggling to get working emulator footage. I could play it fine on my Amiga in the corner. It loaded every single time. And I managed to get a bit of short footage from it at some point when I was just messing around. And then the floppy disk ADF file just completely conked out on me. I tried downloading different versions of it and tried all sorts of emulators, but none of them would work no matter what I did. Thankfully, at Roscoe Murphy over on Twitter, jumped in and gave us some footage. I was really concerned about it because I just had none to put up and it would have been the first episode in almost two years where I've not actually done footage. So it was very, very concerning and it was a big thank you to Roscoe Murphy. Again, thank you. It's always amazing when our listeners jump in with stuff like this and offer to help out. Again, I do record a lot of this on my own and yeah, it does take a lot of work, but sometimes even I need help and Roscoe was there when we needed him. Now, next up is something that amazed me because this is our first on-air question, but Paul Mason stepped forward from Facebook and sent me a quick email and it was nice and simple. I just thought I'd share it on the show and he was just telling me how much he enjoys the show that he's been listening since the Cannon Fodder episode. God, I think that must have been about 50 episodes ago by now. Anyway, he's still with the show, so I must be doing something right. And he just wanted to know which podcast would I recommend because he just started a brand new job. I sort of know how that's going because I'm in that situation myself at the moment. Don't be worrying, guys. I don't think any of that's going to cut into the Amiga Armor preparation time. I'm always open to questions. And after 100 episodes, it's a bit sad to say that we've had very few emails drop in the inbox so when one does drop in i will read it out on the show i do listen to an awful lot of them and you know i've been a podcast regular since about 2009 and i think that was when i first started listening to the giant bomb podcast as the months went on i started looking for more and more 
gaming podcast with retro ones, that sort of thing. I mean, it's hard to say that it's almost become a daily addiction for me, and I think I'll listen to around 10 or more every single week. I can't forget to mention the Amigos and ARG podcast, as I know we've talked about these guys before, but I do my best to work my way through their stuff on a weekly basis. They really are that good, guys. Now, these are 30 minutes to an hour long, depending on what game or thing they're covering, but well worth listening to. To pick at least one out of my regular rotation though, I would have to go with Retronauts. Now there's loads of gaming industry writers with careers going back at least 20 years, possibly more. They really know their stuff and with a weekly catalogue from, well it must have been about 2005 when they started, there's a hell of a lot to listen to. Sometimes they're doing two shows a week, I mean I really struggle getting this one done so God knows how they manage so many on a regular basis. Now this includes everything you could possibly imagine about retro stuff and they always seem to find something else to put a new spin on a story. I must say it's a must listen if you like any sort of retro gaming or podcasting in general. Honestly guys it's a really good show. A couple of other podcasts that I'd like to mention would have to be the Hardcore Gamers 101 and Retrovaniacs. They might not be as well known as everything else, but they seem friendly and very approachable guys that do some great game coverage. Again, this is something I've been listening to for at least four or five years now, so it's going back a fair while. That's probably enough retro gaming podcasts, at least to get you guys going for now. Though, I will have to throw in Dan Carlin's Hardcore History and We Hate Movies, just to show that I do like to mix it up just a little bit. Be interesting to hear what you lot like listening to on a weekly basis too. Searching podcasts is a bit like trying to find, well, decent stuff on YouTube. You know, it's needle in a haystack type stuff. There's so much of it that it's probably impossible to see or hear it all, but I'll give it a damn good go if you guys think it's worth listening to. So yes, I'm all ears. Get them suggestions in. With that, we do need to move on to our underwater adventure with our double fish-fingered friend, James Pond. Before we begin the show, I should probably tell you a lot that I was dreading covering this one this week. I think everyone who plays games always has some sort of, well, an aversion to something that makes them shudder every time that they see it in action or as part of a game. For some, it might be silly things like sewer sections, and with me, when I play any new game, I always run a mile from them if they have loads of underwater levels. It just feels so unnatural and forced. The swimming through treacle, daft gravity, and I think it just goes right back to me days playing Super Mario Brothers as a kid. They never really worked in my eyes. They feel terrible to me and for years I've kept well away from James Pond's underwater agent just because, well, the underwater stuff is practically the entire game. You know me though, Amiga Armour's always up for a challenge. Whether or not it will make a good show is up to you lot. And I know I should swear this, but I promise to try and keep the fishy puns to a minimum. The publisher for this one was Millennium, who did all of the James Pong games, Rome Pathway to Power, one of the greatest Amiga games ever made, more amongst a few others, they were quite a big publisher. Developer wise, this was done by Vector Dean, they did Bad Company, Dogs of War, that's a very good game, again, all the James Pong games. This came out in 1990 and it was single player on just one floppy disk, priced at £24.99. 
The code and the graphics were both done by Chris Sorrell. He did all the other James Bond games, Spitting Image, that's a very good game based on the TV show, and Yolanda, I think that's something to do with an Amazon jumping through a jungle, I'm not entirely sure. Music-wise, the infamous Richard Joseph. He's worked on Barbarians 1 and 2, all the Sensi games, Bitmap Brothers. You know this guy is absolutely massive. Some of the stuff he did was incredible. I was hoping that we could solve one of James Pond's biggest mysteries this week, and that's finding out just what sort of fish he actually is. Every source seems to just call him a fish, and there's a few cod-related jokes dotted around the web, but nowhere can seem to confirm it. Chris Sorrell doesn't even share anything useful in any of the interviews, and Twitter turned up zero when I asked. The 90s were easily the mascot era. Every company was desperately trying to come up with the next big thing like Sonic or Mario, you know, to plaster across all of their games with everything from Bobcats, Acrobats to Spiky Blue, well, Sonic Hedgehogs. They're all getting that animal treatment. It was a very, very odd time. But oddly, fish weren't anywhere to be seen. That is until Chris Sorrell was trying to come up with a fresh idea. One that could be fitted with all manner of gaming situations. He would spend many an hour scrolling things like a big googly eyed goldfish into deluxe paint with some underwater levels sort of designed around the idea and he sort of then presented it to Millennium the publisher. Strangely enough they seemed interested in the idea and soon a new game called Guppy came into being. Millennium were the ones to suggest that the names James Pond would be much better and Chris soon started to wrap all sorts of Bond references around the name. With an underwater theme in place, he looked to Andrew Braybrook's Gribbley's Day Out and Bullfrog's Blood for inspiration. Wanting to use the visual style and flying mechanic, it wasn't very long before these were made into a strong part of the game. Flood was a favourite of his by far, and a few of its enemies copied similar looks as a tribute. For the next seven months, Chris began to completely build, code and draw every piece of art to be used in the game. Chris was always looking to the glory days of the 8-bit era, wanting to be like the bedroom coders of old that he'd read about in magazines, you know, responsible for all of the game's design. It was only his lack of musical skill that seems to have needed any sort of help from somebody else, which was Richard Joseph, and most of the musical touches were his. Chris didn't go through the entire game unaided though, turning to a close friend partway through, Steve Back, who was on hand to help him create the entire game. And together they pulled it into one piece and got it set for launch. The 16-bit release went without much of a hitch and it sold well enough with good enough reviews that a sequel was soon in the making. We did an episode on Robocod in episode 61, which I think was our Xmas special, so it's well worth checking back if you want to learn more about what happened next. Before work on James Bond 2 could begin, thanks to its sales, Electronic Arts showed interest in a console conversion, with them fast providing a US development kit for the Sega Mega Drive. Thanks to its sharing hardware similarities with the Amiga, it was only a couple of months before the full game was fully ported over. And it was also thanks to this that James Pond would hold the record for being the first European developed Sega Mega Drive game. Quite the notch in the belt for something harking back to the days of the good old 8-bit bedroom coding, as well as spawning a lengthy series and a full-on franchise for the consoles. Parts wise, this came out on the Acorn Archimedes, the Atari ST and finally the Sega Mega Drive. Yes, there was no Super Nintendo editions or any handheld games. I hope you're all sitting comfortably, let's have a look at this week's story. So, Mr Pond, your feeble attempts to thwart my plans for subterranean domination have failed miserably. Now I have no alternative but to eliminate you from the game. Pond raised an eyebrow, the whir from the doctor's wheelchair echoed across the room, and for the first time, Pond could see his deadly adversary. Doctor Maybe stroked his fat long haired cat as it languished on his lap. The spoilt Moggy eyed James hungrily and licked his lips. 
pond had a strong feeling that fish was on the menu tonight. The doctor continued, but before you meet your doom, my fishy friend, allow me to describe my fiendish plans. By now, both Pond's eyebrows were elevated. I will hold the world's leaders to ransom with toxic waste pipes which are strategically placed around the globe and ready to pump poison gas into the sea. Everything that lives beneath the waves will perish. Not even the superpowers will dare stand in my way, leaving me free to plunder the riches of the oceans. James had no option but to listen to this warp quack. Meanwhile, the doctor continued, my scientists will explore the subterranean world, learn its secrets, and this dark silent world will be mine. All mine, he laughed manically. Years of dealing with crazed despots led James to believe that this position was completely off his trolley. Now, Double Bubble 7, the crazy doc paused for optimum dramatic effect. It's time for you to meet your maker. Not so fast, dear doctor. I'm not quite ready to meet Captain Birdseye just quite yet. I have but one last trick up my sleeve. Pond pressed his cufflink. At once, a fine cord shot from his sleeve and lassoed a pipe above. Pond launched himself, swinging across the doctor's yacht like a prize cod. Guards, Pond is escaping, the doctor hissed. But Pond had plopped into the water, bullets whizzing inches away from his fishy body. Pond had survived. Once again, he was free to face danger in the watery depths. Once again, he would prove that when all looks lost and the end seems nigh, there would remain one fish with the guts to save the day. James Pond, licensed to thrill and make whoopee. Tell you what, guys, that's probably the most exciting story I've ever told on the show before. <laughs> The first thing you see when the disc finally finishes loading is James Pond roaring into the camera through a golden logo, taking the mickey out of the MGM lion of old. I knew as soon as I saw that that this wasn't going to be like any other game that I've played before. The starting section for a platform game can make or break it and James Pond must be the first one I've seen where it has the main character peeking out of a golden pipe before swimming into the middle of the screen. A glorious rainbow bar covers the lowest part of the screen showing off a countdown timer, number of mission objectives left to pick up and collect with a big score counter at the centre of the bar. To the right is a fish energy bar and Pond himself sticking up fingers to show off the number of lives that he's got left. Our fishy friend is wearing a green tuxedo and yellow bow tie so it's going for that classy James Bond style look straight from the start. This is all ocean based and you do start in the sea but swimming up will let you jump out into the air where if you stay up too long it will drain your life bar. Just like Robocod, the levels are covered in all sorts of collectibles and a few items to match the level that you're in. The ocean surround has rocks and cliffs and the waves move beneath the setting sun. This is dripping with colour and cutesy graphics in all the right places. This is the first time that I've looked at this properly and up close and a lot of the in-game sprites do seem to reappear in the sequel. It's cheeky I know, but they are drawn so well that you just can't mark Chris Sorrel down for reusing them. If this were any other game, it'd be a platformer, so the controls are really quite simple. Fire flings a bubble at enemies which you can then pop and collect what they drop for points. Down and fire picks up an object, usually a key or something to interact with to get through the goal. The goals are all presented in the way of 12 secret agent missions at the beginning of every stage and although you're just collecting stuff each and every time, it breaks it up by throwing in goals like taking gold bars to a boat, sticking keys in locks or taking treasures to people above. Yes, it's cheating a little bit reusing stuff but with stages going off in several directions, it can feel fresh every time. Mess up too much and you will see a game over screen, showing your license being revoked. Not what you need for a super spy. At any point, going back down the start pipe will take you home to where you can have a look around and pop inside James Pond's house. 
There's nothing in there beyond a message to say how many letters of his names you've collected along the way. However, seeing the Titanic off in the background set in and a sunken pirate ship just made me think that Pond's living the high life that we all want to enjoy. The items in the game could do with an episode all of their own. You've got a fishy take on all of James Bond's famous gadgets. A pair of cool shades to see hidden poisonous jellyfish. A goldfish bowl to let you bounce around outside of the water for much longer and even a top hat to make him invincible. These are codtastic extras that add a bit of fin fun to the proceedings. It's not all risk free though with exploding bombs hidden away in there so you've really got to be careful. We have 12 missions in total with either some of the worst or best James Bond puns I've ever heard. Missions like the fish with a golden bar, fish fingers, all kids are forever, you get the idea. It spins each title into a clever item to collect and use so gold bars and contraband fish fingers pop up in the respective stages. The level designs are one of the best parts about it, with oil tankers, the sea floor and snowy waste of the Arctic all making an appearance. I'm not even sure how they came up with half the stuff that you get to see, but all of this can be navigated by swimming around or bouncing on the outside parts of the ocean. Just about every kind of fish you can think of turns up as an enemy too, with sharks, rogue scuba divers, pinching lobsters, Eskimos and random octobi even stealing the show. Mixed in with some fantastic animation, they really do take on a sort of Benny Hill style theme and it's just missing that crazy chase scene that you used to see on the TV show. There's no bosses to be found, so the only worry here is the many enemies on screen. The stages are packed to the brim, and even with a rapid fire of bubbles or blast from the ray gun that you can pick up, you will have to take your time. There's a menu choice to turn off the music or sound effects, and I think you'd be wise to leave them on for this one. Every mission has its own theme, and I'm sure they are cheeky takes on some of the Bond movie soundtracks. It's more flip and plop than any big bangs for the most part, especially for the effects, so you won't be sold to hear it. It's that time of the show though, where we need to have a look at the game's problems. I can't remember if we've ever had a game on this show before that I thought was too easy. When I first loaded James Pond and did my usual poke around to learn the controls and just see how well it played, I managed to breeze through the first few missions in less than 10 minutes. That's amazing coming from me, especially how poor I am at some of these games. The same missions that you see aren't really enough. It could have done with more stages to explore and more things to do. The ones it does have are packed to the gills with content and there's loads to explore, but after an hour or so you will find yourself wishing there was more to see. Next up, there really wasn't many complaints for me this time around. If one thing, I've sort of realised that I do need to do a show focused on blood. Chris Sorrell has said that it's his favourite game of all time, especially for the Amiga, and it's definitely inspired lots of what's in James Pond this week, so I do need to report myself as a problem this episode, because I've never touched this properly before, and certainly never given it the time of day that it deserves. However, we do need to go over to the magazine scores and we all just need to clam down a bit now because I'm a little bit shell-shocked myself at what I'm saying. Amiga Action gave this 88%, See You Amiga 77, The One 86% and Amiga Format at 81%. Overall, not bad, not great, but average all round from most of the magazines. I'd have been quite happy to pick up a copy off the back of those reviews back then and after Lotus I think we're definitely doing another game that's out of place in a trilogy. I'm going to say it but sometimes I really hate having a stupid aversion to games because in a couple of minutes play I thought this was loads of fun. The sly mix of James Bond humour and the way Pond swims in the water is 
almost fast enough to be the same as any platformer. There's no limitations to be seen and the controls are so simple that you never get confused of what to do or how to play. I just wish all underwater sections in other games were like this because I wouldn't be running a mile away to avoid them, especially when they popped up in my radar. Honestly, I was expecting to come away from playing this absolutely hating it. I've got vague memories of brushing over it on the Sega Mega Drive, but I played Robocod at this point and that's by far the better game. The thing is, I finally get it. What makes the Pong game so great? It's the silly puns and sly dig at Mr. Bond with loads of fun gameplay. It might not be the most difficult game to play, and I think it's the ideal budget title. One you could pick up on the cheap and rush through in no time at all. It's not going to keep you coming back for more and more. Given chance, you might get more fun out of playing this once every year or so. With it being a single disc game, it's ideal disc box fodder. Shove it to the back until you've got a little bit of spare time. Not much challenge, but plenty to keep you entertained in a game. Gaming, I think, was different in the floppy disk days. Lots of throwaway titles that only needed to provide the odd fun session, and I think that this is just perfect for that. There's a few issues in there. The music and sound effects are really good with lots of funny bits, and I just loved how it all works together to add to that James Bond type humour. You know what's coming in a future episode, I have to cover the third one in the series. I'm as intrigued as you lot to see how they all finished it and we might just find ourselves hooked on a follow up. This is good guys and gals but it could have been better, unlike my puns. Well, that was a fishier episode than I was expecting to record, but it's time to smoke me a kipper and I'll be back for breakfast, or in Amigurama terms, the same time next week. If you'd like to drop me a line, you can do so on facebook.com slash Amigurama, follow the show on Twitter, which is at Amigurama Pod, or even drop me an email on lafarius at Amigurama.com. As I'm sure everyone's aware, we do have a very active Patreon account. If you would like to hear next week's show a whole week early, you can do so by signing up on there, which is patreon.com slash Amigurama. Every penny does go straight back into the running of the show. We are getting closer and closer to that end of the year time where all the bills are due to be paid. So if anyone wants to contribute, now would be the time. As always, we need to send out a big fishy thank you to all of our Patreon supporters. And this week they are 10 Minute Amiga Retrocast. Go and check out his YouTube channel. Adam Bradley, Darren Coles, Dudley from Yesterzine, another one with a great YouTube channel. I'm always mentioning him on this show, he's a great guy. Gary Hever, Graham Vebke, Glenn Milford from Casual Retro Gamer Weekly, another YouTube show. Tell you what, guys, these would really fill up all your YouTube subscription feeds. It's well worth doing. Uh, next up is Jason Warns, Jan Holbo, Rasmussen, Lawrence Giraud, O'Brien's Retro and Vintage, Pistol, Quentin Barnes, Richard Legg, Richard Pearson, Steve Engeldow, and finally, the perfect finish to the end of this list, Treble. Thanks for listening, and until next time, guys. <laughs>